Hi, I'm Matthew Turner. I'm Matthew Schaefer. And I'm Robert Lowe. And welcome to our session, Teacher Development Through Podcast Engagement. Uh, in this session, we're going to give some practical ideas for how you can use podcasts, both as a producer and as a listener, for teacher development purposes. Okay, so as Rob said, today we're going to be talking about how podcasts can be used for teacher development. And we're going to be looking at two groups of people. We're going to be looking at the producers, the creators, and also the listeners or the users of podcasts. And before we start, we'd like to make clear that today we're not going to be looking at podcasts uh, as a language learning technology. Um, this is a form of professional development, making podcasts for language learners. However, today we're going to be more focusing on the way that teachers can use podcasts to reflect on their practice. So reflecting about practice. Throughout today's workshop session, we're going to be giving you lots of practical ideas for how you can engage with podcasts. And at different stages during the session today, we're going to be inviting you to reflect as well. So we'll be asking you some questions too. Now, although it may be clear to us uh, as to what a podcast is, for some people, you may be unfamiliar with the technology of podcasts. So we define podcasts as user-generated audio creations that are uploaded to hosting websites and delivered to listeners' smartphones, laptops, and tablets through various applications. Now, the reason we're talking about podcasts today is because the three of us are active podcast producers ourselves, and we've had our own podcasting project for about the last six years now. The title of our show is The Tefalology Podcast, and to date we've almost recorded 200 episodes and containing a mixture of interviews and peer discussions amongst ourselves. And we're going to be showing you some examples of our podcast later. So there's been a lot of scholarly research interest into podcasts as a medium, as a media format. Some people have claimed that the use of podcasts, as well as social media, Facebook and Twitter, for example, is a new way for researchers to disseminate their scholarly activities. Others have looked at how the medium can be quite motivating for users. In terms of the producers, some people have claimed that it can be a catalyst for collaborative knowledge development. Taking part in podcasts is a way to create knowledge with peers. And other people have reflected how the aural quality of podcasts lends itself to re re reflection and self-reflection. With regards to the field of professional development, podcasts could be seen as a bottom-up, individual-based option for forming teacher networks. It's also been cited as a valuable and emerging form of online reflective practice particularly with regards to how you can take part in dialogic reflection through the medium. And it also is said to aid communities of practice too, given how it can connect different groups together and how accessible it is across the whole field. Okay, so at this stage, we'd like to give you the opportunity to reflect on what you've just heard. And if you're watching this on YouTube or if you're watching this on Zoom, We'd like you to use the comments area to post your reflections to this question. If you are a podcast user, or even if you're not a podcast user, what aspects of the medium do you find engaging or do you think you would find engaging? So we'd like to invite you to add some comments in your own time. In this section, I'm going to talk a little about podcast engagement as creators and about some of the things that we and other people have done to engage with uh, research and practice through podcasts. So first, I'd like to talk about producing podcasts for active reflection. Uh, we've split this into three points, uh, mirroring the stages of podcast production. So we've got preparation, production, and postscript. In terms of preparation, one thing that we often do is a kind of mini research project. Um, so often we're going to be talking about something that we're not personally educated on or very informed on. Um, and so in order to produce an informative segment for our listeners, 
we have to do mini research projects where we go away and read uh, the most relevant literature about that topic. This obviously helps teachers to uh, learn about an area which maybe they hadn't thought of uh, researching or thinking about before. Um, next, we have two ideas connected to production. This is uh, while you're actually recording the podcast. The first is based on dialogic interaction with your peers, um, something that elsewhere we've called critical co-presentorships. Um, during the process of recording the podcast, you're often discussing ideas with uh, your co-presenters, um, and you're challenging each other and bringing up new ideas and reconsidering uh, your beliefs around particular topics. Um, we're going to show you now a, a short clip from one of our own podcasts, which illustrates this dynamic. We haven't decided negotiation of meaning or for meaning. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. I guess they refer to different things, do they not? Negotiation with meaning, <laughs> I guess. Right? Negotiation about meaning. That's a good point, though. It's not, you're are, not, you, are you negotiating yeah. the meaning of it, or are you negotiating to arrive at... I, I it's, say, both. Yeah. it's both, but I, I, I'd say more of the second than the more, first. Because okay. yeah. I don't think the meaning yeah. is, a, is an existent thing out there. I think the meaning is constructed between people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll end there. Negotiation for meaning. Another way that people can reflect during the production of podcasts is through monologic reflections. Um, this just means talking to yourself, changing your own mind through uh, thinking in action while you're recording the podcast. Again, we're going to uh, give a short clip here um, from fellow podcaster Tim Hampson's podcast to illustrate this phenomenon. My first experience as an English language teacher was five years ago in South Korea. When I went out there, I didn't really have many options, and going to Korea was maybe a way to save a bit of money and figure out what I wanted to do with my life. I did a 120-hour online certificate, which was pretty easy, but it did teach me things like putting together a PPP lesson plan, but not a whole lot more than that. When I arrived in Korea, I was working at a language school teaching middle school children. At this school, I was the only foreigner, but I had some pretty serious, hard-working co-workers who were clearly into English teaching for life. They had a fair bit of training and experience. One of my co-workers had a bachelor's degree in teaching English and had been doing it for 15 years since graduating. Even though she was a really fantastic teacher with all this knowledge, she would often ask me questions about grammar and teaching just because I was a native speaker. You have to remember I didn't really know much about grammar or pedagogy at this point. In career at this time, I don't think you really needed to do much professional development to get a new job. It's one of those weird situations where people come for such short times that if you stick around for a year, you're going to be one of the more experienced foreign teachers around. You might meet foreigners on a night out who are also teachers and feel like maybe they'd moved up the ladder to better jobs just by being here longer, rather than putting in the work to become a better teacher. A final way that producing podcasts can lead to active reflection is through considering audience feedback. Um, of course, when you make a podcast, uh, you send it out into the world and people respond. Um, and often that, uh, those responses can help you to reconsider or uh, think about the things you've been talking about in a new way. Um, so audience feedback is another really important way that uh, podcasters can start to reflect on uh, their beliefs and on their practice. Next, I'd like to talk about producing podcasts for research activities. Um, so the first idea that we have here is creating a form of investigative research. Um, what this means is sometimes in the podcast, uh, we actually use the format of the podcast to investigate a particular phenomenon. For example, uh, during the COVID-19 crisis, um, we asked our listeners to send in their own stories of how they dealt with moving to online teaching uh, suddenly during you know, an emergency situation. Um, so in this sense, the podcast was a form of research itself uh, in which we were generating new knowledge. A second way that podcasts can be used for research activities um, is through the form of interviews. So often uh, people will interview kind of established names or sometimes even emerging names in the field, scholars and researchers, um, and discuss their research with them. Um, in some cases, this is kind of one way where the researcher is just transmitting knowledge to the audience. In other cases, it is much more dialogic and as with the critical co-presentorships, these researchers maybe start to rethink some of their ideas, and you, as the presenter, also start to rethink your ideas. Um, again, we've got a short clip here from another podcast, uh, which illustrates this point. Like, so if I go to the special education teacher or to the student, what kinds of questions should I ask? That's a great question. Well, you certainly start with, what is the student's disability? Where are their deficit areas? 
how can I make this activity that I see the student is struggling with more accessible to them? What are some accommodations and modifications that work for them in other classes? Can I see their psyche eval? Can I see what cognitive abilities they do have deficits in? Can you help me understand this psyche eval? Because all I see are numbers and figures mm -hmm. that don't make sense to me. So um, you actually mentioned, I think, fluid reasoning skills, which was a term I hadn't heard before. Mm -hmm. um, could you explain what that is? So fluid reasoning, in a nutshell, this isn't going to be entirely perfectly accurate because it's very there's a lot involved in it, but in terms of language, it is applying principles in generalized ways. Being able to say, oh, well, when I walk into this airport, baggage is in this area, so I can walk into another airport and probably find baggage in the same area. Mm -hmm. Or, oh, when I had to make subjects and verbs agree here, I have to do it over here. What a lot of a final way that producing podcasts can uh, act as a form of research activity is through the communication of research in audio form. Um, so research for teachers is often kind of locked away behind paywalls in academic journals um, and often also written in a very impenetrable way. Um, however, when you're producing a podcast, you have an opportunity to take that impenetrable material and make it more available for a general audience. A final way that podcasting can lead to professional development is through connecting with the community that's involved in listening to your podcast. So, as I said before, a podcast is not something that just stays on your computer. It goes out into the wider world uh, and people listen to it and they react to it. And um, when you receive that feedback from your uh, listeners, that's also uh, something that can trigger reflection on the part of the podcast producer. Um, so you can see on your screen now uh, an email that we received about um, a segment that I recorded on uh, Paul Pimsler. Um, and here we have one of our listeners um, actually giving us new information and correcting one of the assertions that we made during the segment. Um, so uh, here you can also see my response. Um, in the response, you can see me kind of acknowledging this and changing my mind. So here is an example of how, as a podcaster, you can receive feedback and then learn from that feedback. Also, uh, in terms of connecting with the community, you can widen your professional and social circle. Um, so the three of us, in terms of producing podcasts, uh, we've met many of uh, our listeners um, in real life. Uh, sometimes people have approached us because they recognized our voices, um, which are obviously very distinctive. Um, and sometimes, you know, people recognize our faces and so on. And sometimes, you know, we've presented about this kind of thing uh, at, um, at conferences like this. Um, and this has led us to developing a much wider professional uh, and social circle. Um, and that has led to, you know, the kinds of interactions which have influenced the way that we think about, um, about issues in language teaching, uh, about the field more generally, and about all the, all the different people and the different experiences involved in the field. So these are some of the ways that uh, podcast engagement as creators um, can really lead to professional development. So we've given you some ideas for how you can use uh, podcast creation to engage with research. Um, and now we're going to give you an opportunity to respond to some of these ideas. So you have a question on the screen. How could your production of podcasts support professional development for yourself and others? Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, please type a comment into the YouTube comment window. Uh, if you're watching on Zoom, then please type your comment into the Zoom chat. Uh, and we'll come to these later. Okay, so Rob was talking about uh, engaging with podcasts as a creator or as a producer. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the other side, um, being a listener or an audience member. So obviously just listening to a podcast episode is already a form of engagement uh, in a similar way that reading a research paper or reading a, a journal article would be. Um, however, there are some uh, differences, we think, between uh, listening to a text and uh, reading a text. So um, here are just a few uh, ways in which they differ. Um, a spoken text um, obviously might be more dynamic, more accessible, um, and more approachable, uh, just in terms of the, the format. Um, these sort of texts also tend to be more exploratory uh, in that um, the, the writers, the producers, the people creating these texts um, maybe are less um, likely to be um, presenting something that's already completely thought out or already completely structured um, and are maybe looking for answers as they're creating it. 
um, not always, but a podcast uh, as a spoken text, um, they usually are more dialogic. It's usually um, two or more presenters and they're discussing these ideas. And again, through that discussion, um, they're exploring those ideas and maybe co-creating uh, new meaning and new discoveries. Um, on a very practical level, um, these kinds of things are obviously more portable. Um, you can listen to a, a podcast as you're doing other things, as you're washing the dishes, as you're commuting to and from work. Um, compared to written texts, they are probably going to be less formal and less structured. Um, they, they might be somewhat structured, they might be somewhat formal, um, but again, the, just the sort of understanding that the spoken uh, text um, is going to differ from a written text in that way. It's probably going to be less uh, academic in terms of the language used, um, potentially less reliant on specialist knowledge. Um, certain uh, journals obviously focus on certain areas of the field. Um, podcasts might do that, but um, just by the nature of how they're distributed, um, it's likely that they're going to be um, more targeted at a, at a general audience. And so again, uh, maybe connected to that, they might be less cognitively demanding. It might be something that you can listen to um, obviously, you, you'll want to pay attention, but you may, it may be okay to sort of not, not focus on every single point um, in detail. Um, and again, maybe just a more practical aspect, podcasts are almost always free, um, unlike, some, uh, unlike access to some uh, written texts. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about using um, podcasts, uh, some, some sort of practical tips for using podcasts as um, an informal professional development resource. Um, the starting point could be just if you are interested in a specific aspect of, um, of the field of, of language teaching, um, you can go to whatever podcast repository you use um, and just do a simple search. Um, so an example here is um, looking at, um, for example, if you wanted to know more about CLIL or, or wanted to hear people talking about CLIL, um, here is an example uh, on your screen of what uh, search in um, the Apple Podcasts uh, app came up um, in terms of uh, podcast episodes talking about Quill. Uh, another thing that you can do, um, um, engaging with podcasts um, as your professional development, is just to do some follow-up reading. Um, you might listen to an episode on a particular topic or about a particular uh, you know, uh, practitioner and you want to find out more, obviously the, the podcast isn't going to cover everything, so there's obviously many other resources that you can, you can use to do some follow-up reading or follow-up listening. Um, and then you can also engage in dialogue about the topics that you've, that you've listened to. So this would be um, maybe you and a peer or a colleague both listen to the same episode, and you'll end up uh, discussing that episode and, of course, um, creating your own meanings or cre creating your own understanding about that. And that can happen just, you know, in workspaces or on social media. Um, obviously, one aspect of this engagement with podcasts as a listener is the other side of what Rob was talking about in terms of creators um, interacting with audience members. Um, but also sometimes audience members will just start their own, um, you know, discussion topic threads, um, for example, uh, on Twitter. So here is uh, an example of uh, some people on Twitter, um, and we're not even at this point engaged in this, in this particular discussion. Um, and they're quite critical, actually. We, um, this is based on a discussion that we had on the podcast on the topic of fun in language teaching. Um, but we, you know, we're quite happy that something that we discussed uh, led to this sort of uh, discussion. Um, and you can read this in more detail by either pausing it um, or pause it on the, on the YouTube uh, video. Okay, also going to look a little bit uh, using podcasts more formally. Um, and again, actually, a lot of these ideas are just the, very similar to ways that um, a teacher trainer or somebody running a, a, a you know, faculty development session, for example, might use a written text. So things like um, using, um, giving some uh, pre-listening discussion questions, having uh, your... your uh, so giving some pre-listening discussion questions, um, having people taking part in this professional development then listen to the, the episode or a part of the episode, um, and then some post-listening questions to also um, lead to further discussion. 
Um, you could use multiple episodes um, to make a sort of information gap activity. Half the participants listen to one episode, um, half the participants listen to the other, a different episode, uh, and then come together to talk about what they, what they heard. Um, and even um, having participants in groups make recordings of their discussions about these uh, things that they've listened to and then share those with other groups. There's obviously lots of different opportunities for, um, or different ways of using these texts um, in these sorts of uh, faculty development or teacher training sessions. Okay, once again, we have some questions for you. Uh, and if you'd like to answer them, you could leave a comment or um, put something in the chat. So um, two questions this time. Uh, first of all, how might your engagement with a spoken text differ to engagement with a written text? Um, and then also, how might you engage with podcasts as a listener in terms of um, either using it as a professional development tool um, or maybe also interacting with the podcast producers? Okay, so in this presentation, we've introduced to you some practical ideas about how you can engage with podcasts for your teacher development purposes. If you'd like to read more about our ideas, we have a book titled Podcasting and Professional Development, a guide for English language teachers, where we talk about some of our ideas in more detail, and this is available on Amazon. And if you'd like to listen to the podcast itself, that can be found at teflology-podcast.com. And if you'd like to get in contact with us about anything you've heard today, we have our email here. And here's a list of references we use in today's presentation. So thanks for watching our session today. We hope you found some of the ideas useful. And if you would like to get in touch with us with any questions or comments, uh, we'd be very happy to hear from you. Thank you again.